This is a CO2 cartridge. It is a cartridge that contains pressurized carbon dioxide and it's used by cyclists when they are on the go in case they get a puncture. So they can use the carbon dioxide in this cartridge to inflate their tires after a puncture, say, instead of using a pump. Now on a typical road bike, the pressure inside the tire is usually around 8 bar, so that's 120 psi. In just to give you something to compare it to, a car tire is about 2 bar, so 30 psi, so 4 times lower than that inside a, a road bike tire. So that means that the pressure inside this cartridge needs to be significantly higher if we're going to inflate our bicycle tire to a pressure of 8 bar. So that is the question for today. What is the pressure inside this cartridge? And the rules are no pressure gauges and no Google. The first thing to note about this cartridge is that the pressure inside this cylinder is not fixed. It's not a constant value. As I heat up this cartridge, the pressure inside will build up. We actually have a name for this. It's called Charles Law. Charles Law states that the ratio of absolute pressure to absolute temperature of a gas at constant volume is fixed. Now, this is a constant volume system because it's sealed at the end, the gas has nowhere to go, and so the volume of the gas cannot change. So the pressure inside this cartridge is higher on a hot day than it would be on a cold day. But there's a problem with Charles's law. Charles's law is only helpful to us if we know the starting temperature and pressure in the first place. Then we could use it to say, okay, if these are the initial conditions, increasing temperature by this much will change the pressure by so much to keep a constant ratio. What's missing in Charles's law is any reference to how much gas is in this cartridge. So for those of you who already know where this is going, if we try and sneak the volume of the gas into this equation, this starts looking like an equation that we should all know if we have done basic high school chemistry, and that's the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is what's known as an equation of state. An equation of state in thermodynamics is any equation that relates the pressure, the temperature, and the volume of a gas. That sounds like exactly what we need in this situation, right? But there is a problem in both Charles' law and the ideal gas law. I'll give you a hint. Two out of the three words in ideal gas law are problematic to us. The first one is the word ideal you may ask, what is an ideal gas? And the answer to that is totally circular. An ideal gas is any gas that obeys the ideal gas law. I know, it's quite unsatisfying. An ideal gas is not one particular substance. So, a good example of that is air. If I wanted to work out the mass of air in this room, I know the pressure, I know the temperature, I know the volume because I can measure the room, I can then use that to calculate the mass of air, but only because air in this situation adheres to the ideal gas law. It behaves like an ideal gas because the pressure in this room is low. So it's not that air is an ideal gas. Air is an ideal gas under the conditions in this room. If I took that air and cooled it down a lot, and compressed it, used it, and put it under really high pressure, air would not act like an ideal gas. So all of a sudden, I couldn't use the ideal gas law. So it's not as if there's a boundary to say, all of a sudden the ideal gas equation or the ideal gas law stops working. It's just as you increase the pressure and decrease the temperature, the ideal gas law becomes less and less accurate at predicting the pressure volume temperature relationship. So this isn't a knock on the ideal gas law. I use the ideal gas law every single day because I often work with air at very low pressures and very high temperatures. So because we know we're working with a very high pressure, this is not an ideal situation. The second problem, I said there were two out of the three words that were problematic, was the word gas. 
who's to say that the contents of this cartridge are even in the gas phase? What I said in my last video is that I'm not that strong in thermodynamics and so whenever I don't know how to approach a problem, I use pressure enthalpy charts and that's what we're going to do here. I introduced pressure enthalpy diagrams in my last video. I'm continuing here under the assumption that you've watched it and we've got a vague knowledge of how to get around one. I have plotted the pressure enthalpy diagram for carbon dioxide. Once again, I'm using the mini RefProp program that is free for download from the National Institute of Standards and Technology using the link in the description. Once again, thanks to them for allowing me to use their program in my video. So we need a way of locating ourselves on this pressure enthalpy diagram. Where are we? Earlier I said that the volume of this cartridge is fixed. That should be obvious. Uh, there's another thing that's fixed here, and that's the mass of carbon dioxide inside the cartridge. In fact, when you buy them, you're usually buying a 12, a 16, or a 25 gram CO2 cartridge. If you don't trust the manufacturer and you think you're being a bit shortchanged on your carbon dioxide, you could measure the cartridge before and after releasing its contents to check that the change in mass is 16 grams. This cartridge that I'm using in particular is a 16 gram cartridge. It says so on the label. In trying to locate ourselves on the pressure enthalpy diagram, we're going to end up using a line that we don't often use in process or chemical engineering, and that's a line of constant density. The reason I'm using a line of constant density is that both the mass and the volume of the carbon dioxide inside the seal cartridge are fixed. If the mass and the volume are fixed, the density is fixed because the density is simply the ratio of those two quantities. The reason I say that constant density lines are not something that we use too often in process engineering is because when we're processing chemicals, we're heating and cooling and changing the pressure of substances and it's flowing in pipelines or tanks or something where there, there is expansion and contraction that's allowed to take place. So the density is always changing. Here, we've got a fixed system, nothing's flowing in or out. The only thing I can do is heat and cool. So the 16 grams sorts out the mass. What about the volume? Now, instead of trying to stuff around measuring the dimensions of this cartridge and calculating the volume, I don't know how thick the walls are, I'm going to do something else. Here you can see I've hacksawed the threaded bit of the cartridge, the bit that connects to the adapter that allows you to connect to your bicycle tube. I've done this to allow me to fill it with water. By weighing it before and after filling the cartridge with water, I am able to find out the mass of water it can take, and I know the density of water under ambient conditions, so I can calculate the volume of the cartridge. So if I can fit 21 grams of water into the cartridge, I know the density of water at ambient temperatures is roughly 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and so the volume of this cartridge is 21 milliliters. Think about that. The volume of a tablespoon is 15. So I take my 16 grams of carbon dioxide divided by the 21 milliliters of the cartridge and so I get a density of carbon dioxide of 760 kilograms per cubic meter. That means that no matter what I do to this carbon dioxide cartridge, as long as I don't pierce it, the contents inside here will always have a density of 760 kilograms per cubic meter. I go back to my pressure enthalpy chart and highlight this line of constant density. Now we just need a constant temperature line. Here is the 20 degrees Celsius line and we can see that the point at which they intersect, the pressure is around 58 to 60 bar. It's also interesting to note that this point is sitting on or around the saturated liquid line. So the contents of this cartridge, they're almost entirely in the liquid phase. And that's why I said we can't use the ideal gas law or Charles's law for that matter, because those only apply to gases. There's a very particular reason why we would want the contents of this cartridge to be in the liquid phase. Liquids are denser than gases. If I wanted to have 16 grams of carbon dioxide, this cartridge would need to be significantly bigger in order to fit it. So by keeping it in the liquid phase when I'm manufacturing these cartridges, I can have a nice reasonable size that's easy for me to carry while I'm out on a bike ride.
If I heat up the cartridge from 20 degrees Celsius to 30, I will follow this line of constant density. Usually when we're heating something up, like I did last time when I started boiling a pot of water, we went horizontally across at constant pressure. But the, on that occasion, the kettle was open, so there was no way of building up pressure. Here the pressure does build up because the contents have nowhere to go, so heating will cause a pressure rise. At 30 degrees, the pressure goes up to just under 100 bar. So that means when this cartridge is just lying around in my house and it goes from seeing 30 degrees during the day to say zero degrees at night, the pressure inside the cartridge is fluctuating anywhere between 25 and 100 bar. These are serious fluctuations and that is why they have printed this warning on the cartridge. They say that you should not heat the cartridge to more than 49 Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit. We can see what would happen. If we did this, the pressure in this cartridge would rise to approximately 180 bar. So that leads me to believe that these cartridges are designed maybe for 200, 250 bar if they don't want you to go above 180. If you work with these or manufacture them and know, let me know because I would like to know when these things fail. I'm also guessing here, but I can't know for sure. The part that would fail if you heated it and increased the pressure uh, would probably be this sheet across the top because that's the part that needs to be thin enough for you to pierce it to access the contents when you're inflating your tire. We could test that, but I'm not sacrificing an oven for a YouTube video. Right, so there's your answer. Right now at about 20 Celsius, the pressure of this cartridge is around 60 bar. Next time we're going to depressurize the contents of this cartridge and we're going to see what happens. So you've got a little bit of homework. You've got the pressure enthalpy charts for carbon dioxide. If you don't, you can go and download the mini RefProp program. Go and predict what happens when I depressurize this cartridge from 60 bar and 20 Celsius down to atmospheric pressure. See you next time.